All right, guys, bang, bang. I have my friend Cindy here. Uh, are you ready to do this? Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> All right, you, uh, you've got a whole bunch of stuff that you've done in your life. Let's just start from the beginning. Let's get through your background, and then we'll get to the fun stuff. Yeah. What, uh, where, where'd you start out? Uh, where, how far back do I go? Where were you born? Sure. <laughs> I was, okay, so I'm from upstate New York, like blue collar town. You were either Irish or Italian if you were on my street. And, um, you know, Kodak factory type workers. And, um, and I had an exceptionally adventurous dad um, who moved us from Rochester to the Fiji Islands because naturally, that's a natural move. Um, and that started really what I would say is my conditioning for where I ended up in life because he, every few years we would move. I moved every year from the fourth grade through my senior year of high school. Um, it conditioned me to be really comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, and that's, that's the journey to entrepreneurship. Not that I went there right away. I actually, um, I've always loved businesses. I was a student of business and I had one really instrumental professor, business professor who made me do special assignments and report to her every week on a business, a company I had studied. And out of that, I made a decision when I got out of college, I went to school uh, in DC, small Catholic school, Marymount. And um, I said, I'm gonna go work for Fortune's Most Admired Company. That was it. Like, I'm just gonna go learn from the best. I will take that wherever. It could have been in aerospace. It could have been in whatever. It happened at the time to be Merck. Uh, which is a pharmaceutical company. So I applied, I got the job. Um, and then I realized the hell if I fit in a big environment and they're probably fortunes most admired because they had a great PR department <laughs> and I'm, no one's listening to me and I'm not making a contribution. At that time, my big brother went to work for a startup. And you know, what were these startups? This is like the beginning of the dot-com boom. And um, went to work for a startup and I'm watching him and I'm thinking, holy crap, like he's getting to do all of these cool things. They're like testing that, you know, he's doing all these things he's never done before. They listen to him and he has skin in the game. And actually I got a chance, they were gonna IPO. So I got a chance to participate in friends and family. I had no money, like, I had no money. So for a year, I would every day for lunch, I would eat a bowl of white rice that I could get for a buck. And I would save money and I didn't have much, but when I, at the end of that year, I put all this money in on this IPO and overnight I made money. And I was like, that is what I'm going to go do. And I quit Merck and I went to work for a small company. And then I just kept going smaller till I started it for myself. I, I love it. What, what was the original idea? So when you went out to actually start the first company, yeah. what, what were you doing? What was kind of the thought process behind it? You knew you always wanted to do it, but like what was yeah. the actual genesis of it? You know what? I was sick of creating value for others that I wasn't participating in myself. That's the like Cliff Notes version. But I had gotten to a place in my career where I was you know, going in and helping organizing companies either for IPO or, you know, we were sort of packaging it for sale. So I really kind of had gotten a lesson and what does it take to put together a company the right way? And then I thought, why the hell am I not doing this for myself? And I had enough years that there was enough of a track record of credibility that, you know, it was still ballsy as hell. I mean, look at me. I don't fit the part um, to invest in for a pharmaceutical um, CEO, but I thought the hell with that, I can go find some science and I can take the people like me who exist in these environments. They're you know, high achievers, but they're totally uninspired. Like this is an industry that I love for what it does. I don't love how they get it done. And so I'm thinking, all right, that's my hypothesis. Like, can I get these people, put them together? Well you know what, um, I called it Slate, clean slate, doing it on my own terms. Like I really called it that for that reason, put these people together. We got an asset that was the only long acting testosterone, FDA approved, only long acting testosterone for men. Um, and in four years, we built it to the second most prescribed among urologists. And it was really that DNA. 
Yeah. How does that work? So I think a lot of people don't understand uh, the pharmaceutical industry and kind of yeah. the connection between there's science that goes on and actually developing the drugs, getting them approved. And then there's a whole other part of the business of you got to get the word out. You actually have to yeah. explain to doctors and, and those prescribing why this has value, why it's different, all that. Yeah. Maybe talk a little bit about those two parts of the business. Well, you know, it is like the great mystery, isn't it? Like healthcare in general. And I will say, like, I'm in an industry that I used to say, we were one rung up the ladder from tobacco companies. Not like same level. I mean, let's be honest for people who are watching, like they hate pharma. That's their perception from the media. Um, but you know what we hate in the light of day, we depend on in the dark of night. If our children are sick, we depend on in this moment. I actually think this moment is an extraordinary moment for appreciation of innovation. Um, so, you know, from a pharma company perspective, there is one, this extraordinarily long process of research and development to get a product to approval. We will lose billions of dollars on a bet that something will work. Um, that is a rigorous process, all regulated, blah, blah, blah. Once you've got that approval, you now have to educate the market. Um, we all know, like, you can't turn on the TV and not see a drug ad, but, you know, most of that behind the scenes is really going in and educating a clinician base. And my first company, Slate, actually had an asset that was FDA approved already. Um, it hadn't been really marketed. And so my um, mission was in, act in actually to educate the market and get the word out. Um, so I built an organization that was dominantly, you know, in-field um, folks that called on doctors around the country, urologists specifically. Yeah. So I can say this because I know you well enough. Uh, you're one of the best marketers I know. Uh, <laughs> absolutely world-class at it. Um, and so it's funny to me that you started out with the testosterone drug because you yeah. were actually better known for not helping men, but for helping women. That's right. How do, <laughs> how do you go from slate to sprout? So can I tell you the craziest thing is I've kind of been at this for a long time. So when I bought that product, what was so interesting, it was made by this brilliant formulator. He owns a patent in our industry for extended release products. He never marketed it. He's like a, he's like a bad scientist who invents these great concoctions, but it wasn't his dream to, um, to commercialize it. And what, what it was being used for was women. That wasn't what it was approved for. It was approved for men with low testosterone, but because we had never come with a solution for women, people were using it what's called off-label, like off of what it's indicated for. And I thought, this is crazy. But I, it started my like awareness, if you will, around how prevalent this issue was for women and the lengths to which they would go to address it. So here I am building my company, Slate. You know, we're not that it wasn't, really hard at the beginning, like really hard, but we finally hit our stride. You know, the curve started to look like this and I'm going to all of these scientific meetings and the biggest conversation is about finally there's going to be one for women. Like we have a beat on the science for what it is that truly unlocks desire for women. The answer is not to masculinize women by giving them testosterone. Uh, the answer is to address what's going wrong, which is for women, a neurochemical imbalance. Um, and so that was my radical moment when I'm watching the science, I'm watching every big company with way better resources than me, look at an extraordinary market opportunity and walk away. And that's when I decided to walk in and why? I sold off the profitable business in men. What, why did they want to walk away. Well, actually, before we go into that, let, let's yeah. talk about just the science itself, because I think a lot of people don't understand. Yeah. So first of all, we're talking about sexual desire. Yes. There's men's sexual desire and women, and the science shows that those are two very different things. Maybe describe just the difference between the two, and then we can talk about kind of what you did to navigate this. Yeah. So, you know, when we look at sex, desire gets the party started, right? We, we have desire, we hopefully become aroused, uh, we orgasm, I hope, uh, and there's no pain present. That's how you really study sex. But for women, you know, what we had been doing is saying like, hey, it works in men. Ah, let's see if it works in women, which is honestly pervasive across medicine, not just in this category. Um, but for women, what we had learned from brain scan imaging, and if you look at the world of medicine, in the last two decades, probably our our greatest discoveries have come from the ability to do PET scans, uh, functional MRIs. 
So we knew from brain scan imaging that if you put a woman in an MRI who something like the switch went off, she used to want it, she doesn't want it anymore, like she knows it has changed, versus a woman who's totally happy with the ebb and flow of desire, exposed to neurotic cues, their brains light up totally differently, totally differently. And so what we knew is there's a neurochemical basis. We're very animalistic when we have sex. We uh, basically, I call it, we close all the tabs in the brain. We shut everything off to enjoy the experience. For a huge percentage of women, they can't shut it off. There's been a disruption in the balance of these chemicals that allow that to happen. And that's where their desire basically leaves the room. And for me, that was so compelling. So compelling because if you sit and you talk to somebody who's going through this, it's not just affecting them in the bedroom, it's affecting them in all aspects of their life. Did I yeah. answer your question? No, absolutely. And, and so as you saw this, and there was a big difference there between men and women, yeah. you sold Slate off and start Sprout. Maybe talk a little yeah. bit about the transition between the two companies. Yeah. So, um, you know, for Slate, Slate was a testosterone product that is often used for male libido or, you know, a variety of symptoms if their testosterone goes um, off. And for me, like the calling was finally getting the first woman. At the time I did that, time I sold Slate, there were 25 FDA approved drugs for men and not a single one for women. 25, there were 26 by the time I finally crossed the finish line. And we could talk about how different that path was for the little pink pill versus the little blue pill. But from a transaction perspective, you know, when I sold, it's funny, Slate, very few people even talk about my first business, Slate. Um, and yet I really think that's where I earned the stripes, right? That was the real first lesson of putting it together myself. And when I got a beat on this, this um, science out of Germany, I spent a year exploring it. It was inside of Slate. I actually sprouted out of Slate one day before I sold Slate. And I sold Slate because, you know, I'd gotten it to a place where it was a natural, um, you know, acquisition target. Um, they could take it to the next level. And I needed, frankly, the money from my shareholder base to take this on for women. Mm -hmm. It was pretty, pretty incredible. Well, are you allowed to say how much you sold the first one for? I'm not, but we'll call it hundreds of millions. So my point is, uh, it wasn't a small sale. This was not <laughs> yeah. a, uh, oh, I just happened to find someone down the street. This, yeah. this was a pretty big deal. Um, and then obviously you then take uh, a lot of those investors yeah. uh, on another journey with Sprout. Talk a little bit about kind of that original idea of just like, let's go solve this problem for women yeah. uh, ends up becoming worth uh, many more hundreds of millions of dollars ends up being yeah. in the uh, in the billions. But go yes. ahead. You know, it, I, I really... I, I think I was called to it a little bit. Like for me as a woman in this space, first of all, I'm such an unusual bird that I'm a female CEO in pharma, then put me as a female CEO in sexual health. And I'm running a company for men. And when I sold it off, I really turned around to my shareholder group and I said, I made you a lot of money. Now give me some of it back and we're gonna go again. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they did. And I think they did because uh, you know they had seen me in action and what I had built with Slate, but also I think they knew just how deeply like I felt this, that we had to do it. It, it was a radical bet. It's completely binary, right? I was either, I, my fate is controlled by the FDA. I had to get this through the FDA. I was gonna win big or lose big. And, um, and it was such a process to go through that. You know, Slate was, um, there was a, a, a group that we made 40x their money. Like uh, Slate is the story of, I maxed out all my credit cards. I hid when the phone rang because they were calling me. Like, you know, it was the real kind of first version uh, of startup. And then Slate became, or in Sprout, excuse me, became this like phase two that felt very straightforward to me. Like I knew I had to go out and do a very specific double blind, a placebo control. You know, there's a very straight path for science. What was crazy about that is when I went on that path and I did everything that I was supposed to do, the FDA rejected me. That was a bad day. <laughs> that was really right. a bad so ride. What was their logic for rejecting the first time? Yeah. Yeah. You know, honestly, the, the answer was, well, you know, we think the benefits are modest um, and therefore no to any risk. 
And like, if you think about it, so in medicine, and I, I would say in life, like everything comes down to benefit risk, right? Benefit risk, which feels very objective, but it's totally subjective. Because if we don't assign any value to something, then we'll never take the risk. And what was happening is, let's be honest, we do not value women's pleasure. For 20 years, we have turned on the radio or television and we have been told subconsciously that men's sexual pleasure matters. Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, I can keep going and going and going. You still hear these ads today. There's huge businesses built on this premise. We value sort of sexual performance for men and for women we're like, eh, because they can have sex whether or not they want it. But really is that, I mean, is that right? When we know scientifically that we can help women who have a neurochemical issue that we would actually just say like, does it matter if they have sex like a few more times a month? The answer is if it matters to her, it's her call. And I think that's where it really ignited me. Um, you know, from the standpoint, I'm very proud of our scientific package. We have 13,000 women that we studied. I'll give you context. The average new drug approval in the U.S. is 760 patients. We have 13,000. Let's talk about a huge data set. Viagra, that's a good comparator. Viagra had about 4,000. Viagra was perceived to meet such an important unmet medical need that it got fast-tracked through the FDA and approved within six months. The prevalence of women who deal with low, frustrating low libido is the same as ED. It took me six years in the same queue. So you go the first time, they reject you. Yeah. When you hear that news, do they send it in a letter or a phone call? Or what A fax, okay. But what is your reaction when you get that fax? Okay, so I got a call. Um, I had just landed, I'm based in Raleigh, um, and I just landed back at RDU and I sat down and like didn't move for two hours. I, I, was, I was paralyzed. I'm like, I did all the work. I met all the endpoints. This is statistical significance in a double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. And I, I sat down and I thought, and honestly, this was going through my head what the hell am I going to tell my team? And they were, you know, we were small, but they were so committed. We had worked so hard. And I went into the office, it was on a Friday, and I like got everybody around the glass table, um, pops into my office. And I said, I said, listen, here's what we just learned. And I don't have any answers. I, you know, everybody needs to go home this weekend and work on their resumes. Like it's completely within their control. So that weekend, um, I, I like went home, I cried it out, I'm, I'm honest. Um, I woke up the next day, I went back, got on email, and I went back and read the letters of all the women who had written me, who knew I was doing this saying, thank you for letting me know I'm not alone. Thank you for doing this. I'm losing my marriage over this, this matters to me. And one woman, wrote me who had been watching this. She'd been in our clinical trials and she said, I need to meet you. And she was close by. So I went to meet her. I went to get a, a coffee with her. And I got to tell you, like when I walked in the coffee shop, we didn't know each other. I had never seen her before. Um, I knew it was her. Like she was coming across the room walking and I was like, okay, type A, like in charge. And that's prototypical actually for women who have this. Like they're so like highly information processing, their brain never quiets. Um, so she comes walking over, you know, it's like a first meeting. She's telling me about herself. She's built this, this she runs her own business. So she's built a company. She has two beautiful boys. She's showing me pictures. She has a husband she adores, but this shit is going on. And what she said to me is she said, I have succeeded in every aspect of my life other than this. And I thought, if that is not the portrait of a woman, she has raised her hand a thousand times. She said, hey, something's different. Something's changed. Can you help me? And she'd been patted on the shoulder and she'd been told, oh, take a bubble bath. It's okay, just relax. And yet we know this scientifically. So I said, can I show you something? I popped open my MacBook. I'm showing her the brain scan studies. I look at her, she is crying, pouring tears. And that was my moment. 
And I was like, this is why I'm doing it, right? I had to like, mm, get myself up together. I went in to the work on Monday. I got everybody back again around the glass table. And I said, we are going to dispute the FDA. <laughs> there was a moment of silence, which is, we're going to fight the government? And I'm like, yep. And the reason I did it is because we had the data. And what we were doing is we were not listening to women. What does it mean to dispute the FDA? Like, I don't even know that, that that's possible. <laughs> no, that was probably one of the first questions. Like, Can we do that? There actually is a mechanism. So you get a decision, you know, FDA is a huge bureaucracy like every other government agency and you get reviewed by divisions. We happen to be reviewed by the urology division because they had reviewed all the sex drugs. Not that that's how we work. We work on the brain, but in all the sex drugs before had been for men, so it didn't really make sense. But there who reviewed us, there's a mechanism by which you can basically take it. I tease, I call it the Supreme Court of the FDA. It's not literally what it is, but it's really sort of like that process that you dispute. What happened after that is they had public meetings and I give them credit. To their credit, they opened their doors and they invited women in. And like women, you know, took time off work, flew across the country, talked about what was going on in their bedroom at a federal agency. They were remarkable. And, um, and they came in and after three public meetings or at the third public meeting, the FDA basically assembles an expert panel um, you know, of scientists from across the country. And then they put you on trial. Like you present, it's the craziest thing. It's like being in a courtroom. Nobody can believe this is really how it happens. We literally get up, we present, the FDA talks, the public gets a chance at the microphone. You would not have believed how many people were packed in this room. And, uh, and ultimately this panel of scientific experts having heard all of the data make a decision and they vote like by like audience response at that moment. And I got to tell you, I can remember, I was looking at a big screen. I'm sitting in the audience. I have security around me, by the way, because this, I got death threats. This was so controversial. And I'm holding my phone and I'm going like this. And my hand is just shaking because that was it. Like that's the moment. And they voted overwhelmingly to approve the drug. That's awesome. What, because what it was were a you, third day in court. What, what were you thinking when you see that the vote goes your way? Like, do you jump up and start screaming and just like throw your middle fingers up at everybody? <laughs> you know what's crazy is I can, um, I can remember a few things from that day and then I think I blacked out for moments. Um, it, what's so funny is to read the text from back from the day because there were moments where people were like, oh my God, we're gonna win, we're gonna win. Oh my God, we're going down, we're going down. And it was such a roller coaster ride. Um, but in that moment, I was just so, like calm in that moment. And what was so incredible to me is the cheers that went across the whole crowd. And I get emotional thinking about it. I gotta tell you, this does not happen often at a, at a federal agency and at the FDA. And Nightline came out that night and the clip they showed was the cheers. And like the cheers were like, that doesn't happen when a drug gets approved, but it was such a win. Science won, make no mistake, science won, but women won that day too. And that really mattered to me. During the course of it, when people would get up and look, people at the public mic were supportive and hateful, detractors. And I, my big brother was there with me and I have two big brothers, both were there, uh, but one was sitting right next to me and he kept having to like tell me, you know, he would spin everything for me. He's like, what they're really saying um, is that you're very committed. <laughs> like he, would, he would spin it. Uh, my dad came, my whole family came. Um, my dad was there and I insisted, I'm like, dad, you can't sit near me. Like you can't, because he was so emotional. Like I couldn't take it. So he sat in the back, it's crazy. <laughs> and so you get it approved. It's this like crazy moment. And then what, within 48 hours, there's an even bigger... Yeah. Uh, announcement what happened there yeah um so i sold it for a billion dollars up front and a whole lot on the back end and that was the day after it got approved it, we announced it two days after that was one hell of a week so it got approved i got on a plane i went up to new york we did incredible press it was so fun for the approval because it's like we were the biggest news story in the world the day that it was approved it was massive global news 
um, so much fun. And then literally the next morning was on Squawk Box announcing um, that I had sold it. And I'll tell you how that materialized. When we had that public meeting where they voted overwhelmingly to approve, the FDA, that's not the FDA's final decision. That's the decision the panel has given them. But the whole world knew they're getting approved. So it takes a few more, you know, it was like a couple months before they gave the, the uh, final. The day that happened, that uh, vote, the big companies came knocking on my door. And there were three. And, and so like, do they call you? Do they text you? Do they email you? They, <laughs> they, um, they I don't know. I think they all emailed me. I, I got to think about that. It was the, e the, the email started coming in like, hey, we'd love to come to Raleigh and visit with you. And those stories were crazy. You know, I can think about getting into the room. There was there was one suitor uh, that came in. We went, we were at a hotel. My team was sitting with me. I had printed out like binders of all of this data and press and everything else. And the woman I work with, who's a rock star attorney, um, came with me that day. And she's sitting next to me. She's like got all the binders, but they're so big. She's like, put them down on the floor. And um, they make us an offer. And they totally lowball us. 200 million was the offer. And, uh, and so they say, you know, it, it's very dramatic. They give this big speech on how they're gonna take such good care. And it's, you know, $200 million. And they're like, we're gonna let you think about it. And they walk out of the room. So I'm sitting there looking at all my team and they're sort of looking at me and I'm like, all right, when they walk back in five minutes, get up, walk out the door. <laughs> and I'm like, five minutes, get up out the door. So they come back in and I'm like, we are really so flattered. Um, but we're going to go it alone. Thank you so much. And literally the whole team gets up, walks out the door and the lawyer who's sitting next to me, Josephine is like, she's like pointing like the binders, the binders. And I'm like, leave them, leave them. <laughs> she's like, and she's pointing and we're like, I'm like, get out, get out. So we get out of the room. And what I said to her, she's like, why do we leave all those binders? I'm like, cause that will make them call us back. I they now it. have a reason, right? And so sure enough, like literally we weren't, the hotel was across the street from our offices. We were literally walking into our office and I got a phone call and they're like, we have your binders. I'm like, oh, that's fine. You keep them. They're for you. <laughs> and that like allowed the door to still be open and that, that uh, conversation to keep going. I love that. And, and so obviously you end up selling it for a billion dollars in cash, which I think a lot of people, when they hear a number like, Hey, I sold my company for a billion dollars. Yeah. Most deals are uh, stock and equity and earnouts. Like that was just cash. Okay. Uh, and so I ask every single person, what do you do when you see a billion dollars <laughs> wired? Right? Like, you know, I, I just imagine you look in the bank account and there is $1 billion. What is yeah. the reaction? You know, I, I have a weird relationship with money. If I'm being totally honest, I don't know. I got up the next morning, I went to work. Like, and I'm not saying that I wasn't, you know, so proud of it. And, um, but it's really like, it didn't change anything about what I still wanted to do. Um, and I just got up and I went to work. I have a guy that is my financial uh, advisor and, and I have, I laugh, I have told this story, but it was not that long ago. And he came into the office and he basically said, well, you live in the same house, you drive the same car. And then he looks at me and he goes, I'm pretty sure you were wearing that the last time I saw you. <laughs> so we're good. It, it was unbelievable, but the work wasn't done. You know, the work was just like getting started uh, for getting it to market. So it was, uh, it was, there were, there were little moments of reflection. I will share, Gail King had me on CBS this morning to announce um, the approval. And, you know, that was the pressure sitting in the green room at CBS this morning and, and, um, and getting on set. And then the next day we were on Squawk Box and announced the sale and she wrote me a, a little uh, email and she's like, oh, sure, you couldn't have said that on my program. And she's like, you are a badass. And I still have it on my desk. Like that is, it was so flattering. So moments like that really, um, you know, made a, a huge impression on me. For sure. And so since then, uh, you've gone on to do investing, 
Pinky Bader, yeah. a, a bunch of things to kind of help other women yeah. um, or women focused businesses. Maybe talk a little bit about some of the other stuff you did and then we'll get to the really fun part where, uh, where you may or may not get the drug back. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, what's crazy is I sold the business. I thought I was gonna stay. Um, clap, maybe it's a classic story of, uh, you know, founder, mama bear, um, not getting along with new acquirer. Um, I was invited to leave, as I like to say. Uh, and I had to like sit on the sidelines and, you know, check myself. They paid a billion dollars for it. Know that it, I still would be there and cheering it on, but also figure out like what's next. And it's extraordinary, right? Like if you can have any possibility or you have no possibility, what do you choose? And for me, I think that what was so clear is I had literally lived a front row lesson in what it means to advocate uh, for yourself and for other women. And look, I'm, I'm not actually somebody who talks a lot about you know, was, was, was I in a male dominated industry where there are crazy moments in, you know, in a room where you were marginalized or whatever? Sure, but I was gonna get through it. Like, I understand it. It's very different for me to like experience that at a mass scale. And so I thought, well, the hell, like I need to invest in disruption. Like, I don't only want to disrupt in the market for technologies that we need in women's health. I wanna disrupt a mindset of who has the next billion dollar idea? And that matters to me. And Prompt knows some of the profile of uh, women that I invest in. And you know, I've got this great engineer, but she's gorgeous. Like she's 5'10", she's blonde, she's Texan. And let's be honest, like when she shows up on Sand Hill Road, they're sort of like, no, nah, okay. You know, like it's very hard to actually get beyond that, but she's gonna sell her company for hundreds of millions of dollars. And like the next time somebody looks like her walks in the room, we all reach for our wallet. That, that is like part of the design. Um, uh, and so it's been a, wonderful for me to get to invest in things that not only I think are groundbreaking first, I, I love the big challenges. Take the big crazy ass swing, right? That has little probability of going through. I think we're pretty good at that. And they're often like catalysts in social change um, as well that, that just matter to me. Flushable pregnancy test. Yeah. So, cool. uh, so I can say this because uh, I, I know you well enough. And I asked you one time um, behind closed doors, you could have lied, you know, all through your teeth to the public. But behind closed doors, I said to you, uh, why are you doing this? And this is when yeah. you were investing and, and kind of really, you know, pressing the gas on, on the pinky baiter. And you said to me to make women fucking rich. Yes, <laughs> that's right. And I remember just walking out of there being like, Cindy is a fucking badass. <laughs> <laughs> that actually was so controversial when I, they, somebody was, you know, when you first start, people are like, well, what's the mission? Well, what are you doing? Well, blah, 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 blah. And you try to explain them. I'm like, to make women really fucking rich. And you know, we should, all of us should want that. May the best man or woman win. Just yeah. let's be, a, let's be, a, give it a fair shake. Let's not overlook an idea because we think it's niche because it affects half of the population. I'll take that idea. And I mean, that really does happen. Just I'll get and by the numbers is how you bear it out, right? 4%, 4% of investment dollars go to women's health research. Four. That's crazy. And so those are the things that really ignite me. And, and it is about picking people who are going to get to a finish line. Like I like, I'm a, I'm a early, CEO. I think you're a founder CEO or you're a forever CEO. I'm a founder CEO. I like to build it. I like to build it from scratch and create enough value that somebody else comes in and acquires it. And that's really the profile of the companies I'm taking on too. Yeah. Um, you've got a team that uh, was with you, Slate, Sprout, investing, yeah. what you're doing now, uh, and they all stick with you. And yeah. you've got everything from embarrassing, funny nicknames for them to uh, the quirky culture. Uh, you wear pink every day, kind of all these different elements uh, that you've built. Like, talk a little bit about just building that culture and, and how you've kept a team together for so long through multiple iterations of the work you guys are doing. You know, um, culture was the, the agenda for Slate. I mean, honest to God, that was the most important piece of it for me is how do you build a culture of ownership? Let me be specific about it. 
So for me, right, why would you leap and do it for yourself? You want skin in the game. You want a piece of what you create. And I've got the recipe for everybody to be wildly successful in building your business. Treat everybody like the owner of the company. Give them a piece of what they get out of bed every day and go to work and do for you. And I think we have, um, you know, an outrage. It, it, it actually creates um, an environment of what I'd call constructive irreverence, right? If everyone's the owner, like they're challenging. They're challenging. And I'm not the only person trying to hold people accountable. Um, it's really that everyone holds each other accountable because we're going to cross a finish line. And when I look to my left, you better deserve to be there. And, um, and I really think that has been a piece. I also pick, we are total misfits. Lots of you know, entrepreneurs will say this, but I have always seen myself as a misfit. Um, and I am definitely attracted to other people who are misfits. Um, and I think that kind of culture creates this extraordinary quirkiness and individuality that has you achieve incredible things. When I got into big companies early in my career, what was so counterintuitive to me is that they were trying to beat you into sameness one way this is our way here's how we do it and like you have to have processes and companies but you're you are missing the boat if you're taking that away from people so my culture is um really simple i say you make six choices to come work for me uh, and we really and i hire against it i fire against it i incentivize against it um and they sound like you know, um, I don't know, one of my choices is quirky. What the hell does that mean? How do you interview for that? I don't say to people like, are you quirky? Yes, okay, check that box. Like you're really finding that individuality, but I think it's ownership mindedness, it's boldness, it's quirkiness, it's that they're all learners. Like we are never so arrogant to think that we know it best. We constantly go and learn from others, especially outside of our industry. Um, we're, we truly are family. Uh, we're very loyal to one another. I think, you know, we can do this behind doors, but when we walk out, we're locked arms against the world and we're appreciative. And I think even in the darkest moments of, and there were, look, there were moments when we were hanging on by a thread. Like we were going to be shut down the next day. There was still like an underpinning of like a pre marveling at what we were trying to do. And I think that has gotten us through uh, all of these years. Yeah, uh, Pomp knows Nurse Ratchet. She's been with me. Do I need, I don't even need to describe why this is her nickname. Um, but, you know, Ratch has been with me for 17 years. Like she's, she can tell all the crazy ass stories, um, you know, that we've had. But like, there's something about that. And I will say, you know, when I sold this company, and I cheered them on from the sidelines. It, the most important thing was that my people stayed when they were gone and they moved on in their life and I got it back. I picked up the phone and I'm like, hey, and like their husbands, their wives, their kids are like, oh no, oh wait, Cindy's calling. What's gonna happen, mom, dad, you know, whoever. And, um, and I was like, hey, we're gonna do this again. And they dropped what they were doing and they came back to do it. All right, so. You sold the business for a billion dollars in cash. Yes. You make your investors, yourself, everyone's walking away very happy. Yeah. Uh, they take the drug and uh, maybe don't do what everyone thought was possible with it. And now you are sitting here and somehow you have the drug and they gave you cash. Uh, and now you are running a business with that drug again. How does that happen? Right? There's only one other person that I know. So, so uh, I'm going to pick on him a little bit. Doug Lebda. Uh, sold uh, Lending Tree. Uh, yeah. They then grew it. Um, and if I remember correctly, uh, they he basically sold it. It fell like 75, 80% in value. He went and bought it back, right? So he actually paid for it and then went and grew it again. And yeah. so uh, that is a story that's happened before. I've never seen somebody sell the business and then basically the acquirer says, keep the cash, get your drug back and like leave. And here we'll give you a loan so you don't have to be distracted with fundraising. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, that was, it's an extraordinary story and you get smarter as you go along. Um, so I'll tell you how that happened. Uh, well, first of all, they, I could not have written this movie. Like the way that it played out and maybe it's the first drug for female pleasure was going to have the most most insane story. Not only our story and fighting the government, but then, you know, you win. And, and it's really like the entrepreneur's dream come true. We were 35 people. 
when we created a billion dollars worth of value, 35 of us. And you know, they were gonna march it across the globe and make it affordable in ways that we really couldn't at that moment in time. They take it, they're gonna keep me and all the team. They invite me to leave. Three months later, they dismantle my entire team. They put it on the shelf. So what happens is we announce the sale, you know, it takes a while before those close. On October 1, it closed, that was in 2015. 11 days later, they got a letter from the Department of Justice. And there was an investigation because they hadn't disclosed this pharmacy relationship that they had. No one knew, none of their sophisticated investors or anybody else knew. And, um, and the world went boom. And the truth is we were the last thing in the door. Um, I was not happy, not having, I'm in the middle of about to go into a launch. And, um, and so I become a liability, I'm gone. Um, then the whole team is gone because they're trying to save their core business, which is burning to the ground. This, the, the day that we sold to them, like they were the darling, they were 260 a share. They traded down into the teens. So the truth is it just got deprioritized. It was put on the shelf and we had fought so hard to finally, women got one on the board and the women who needed it couldn't get it. And I used to mystery shop it. Like I'd go to Target, can I get it? No, it's not available, crazy. So um, they got a new CEO, they fired their CEO, total turmoil. And he was on the job about two weeks. He's a lovely man. And I sat down and I said, can I get it back? And he was like, we just paid you a billion dollars for it. Like this has a ton of value. I'm like, well, good. I'm glad you remember that because my shareholders do as well. And not in a threatening way, but like for real, there's a lot of value here. And our transaction was structured. So here's where I got smarter. When I sold Slate, um, I got money up front and then I got money on the back end. I participated in royalties, mailbox money for years, uh, which was great. It, but it was governed by boilerplate language, best efforts clause, classic legal language, best efforts clause. Well, actually, when you do that, what you realize is, well, your best efforts and my best efforts are different. So like, you know, as a founder, you sit there like, oh, they should be doing this or not doing that. And you like have angst about it. So when I sold Sprout, I wrote the same deal. We had all of this money coming on the back end but it was governed by very specific performance obligations. And they weren't outrageous. They were like, how much money will you spend on marketing? How much money will you spend on field education? Ah, da, 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 da. They weren't meeting any of them. So when they blew me off, um, I sued them uh, in the court of Delaware in exchange for dropping the lawsuit. I got the company back and I kept the billion dollars and got a loan to get started. <laughs> I win, they win. They get a participation in royalties, but um, not a bad deal. So what have you done so far? Because now oh, you're sitting okay. <laughs> now now you're sitting here with the drug back. You've got the company to kind of get a second shot at it. Uh, I think you would say that you are not only a uh, billion dollars richer, but also uh, a plethora of knowledge and experience in yes. terms of what you can go do now. So what's kind of the plan, and where are you guys at? I gotta tell you the best part, like if, you know, in my world, it's a pink lining, not a silver lining, but the pink lining is I had to sit on the sidelines for a few years and I had to go, all right, well, what would I be doing? Well, what's changed? Well, how would I be smarter about it? And so I, I was sitting there kind of doing that class, if you will, in my head for a couple of years. And when I got the product back, um, look, it is hard. It wasn't like I got it back and it was here. I got it back and it was here. Because really to do nothing with something that was the biggest news story in the world damages it. Because people don't know the inside story. So like their perception is, well, that didn't go anywhere. The reality was, how could it have? No one was marketing it. It wasn't stocked in any pharmacies across the United States. It was insane. Um, so we have um, fixed all the supply chain. We've gotten it you know, ready. And we've imagined, this is the thing I'm probably most proud of, we've imagined a path in which women can have this conversation from the comfort of their couch. Privacy of their house, doctor license their state, doesn't require a physical exam. So telemedicine, so think about that. We were ahead now in COVID world, all of us are talking about telemedicine as the future of medicine. Thankfully, we got a jump start on it and, um, and it ships to your doorstep, you know, like an Amazon like experience. And so it's been fascinating. I'll tell you, it took me a while, like, 
I had to go back and work with the FDA on some of the labeling things that were, you know, should have been modified based on some data. Um, I had to get all the supply chain set. But this year, really, it's just this year, um, we turned on um, real advertising. And like the first ad ran on Howard Stern. And like I sat in my car and cried like a baby. Because <laughs> it was, it's been 10 years to get to that moment. And so I think everybody will start to hear a lot more about it. I mean, then COVID hits, right? And here I am again, like it's the, my story is like, right when you think it's, you know, it goes sideways. And for me, like a lot of that brand awareness and everything that I don't have metrics yet on and conversion and everything else, like you go, all right, I'm holding. Like I got to hold and hang on to my, hang on to my people um, who are the most important component of the business. And then we'll figure it out from here. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the telemedicine stuff. Cause I think people are starting to see, you know, before this happened, uh, it was yeah. becoming a little bit more popular. Now, obviously with COVID, it's like the talk of the town, just how yeah. you see that whole part of the industry. Well, look, I'll, I'll sound like such a, uh, a VC type person, <laughs> which I'm not, um, I'm totally an operator, but let's be honest. Let's think about like investments that have done phenomenally well of, of, uh, of late. Like we think about that intersection of digital and consumer what were people chasing? They were chasing the Dollar Shave Clubs, the Warby Parkers, like all of those. Um, I think that the next frontier and everyone is chasing the intersection of digital and healthcare. And telemedicine was really born out of helping people in remote areas who couldn't get to doctors. But let's be real about stats. It takes 29 days on average to see your primary care doctor. Forget your specialist. 29 days to get into a primary care doctor's office. We all know what that experience is like sitting with the clipboard and like, you know, somebody sneezing next to you and everything else. For so many conditions, we don't actually need a physical exam. We can have this exchange by a video. We can have a phone exchange. We could even have a digital exchange. When you have my medical history, it is telemedicine is the future of medicine. 100%. It is more cost effective. It meets our schedules and how we all consume today. We're not going to tolerate taking the time for that. And it actually, I think, in many ways, I, I've been through so many of these experiences now as I tested telemedicine, it's so comprehensive. You know, you can go online and do your vision test to get your glasses. It's brilliant. Um, so I'm really such a huge fan of that. And I think that's, you know, that's here to stay in an epic way and probably... While it has been here, we are all slow as humans to change habits. Um, COVID has sort of forced that change. Yeah. And, and how much of this is dependent on the doctors and, and the regulations kind of complying yeah. with it versus uh, those things already allowed for this and it was just a technology barrier? Yeah. I, so there's a, they have been a little lessened right now in this moment in time. You know, everything from a, everything is governed by regulation, obviously, in this industry. Um, and while you can get Addy through a telemedicine experience, I have no, like, it's a wall between me and them. They, they literally see on my site, you are leaving us to go to another company. I went to a bunch of telemedicine companies and said, look, here's my hypothesis. Women would prefer to not necessarily bring this up in person, but to have a, you know, private conversation. If you will educate all of your, uh, you know, clinicians in your network, like I will shoot, send them your way. And we have a variety of them that we work with. Um, but there's really, you know, FaceTime was built with HIPAA compliance. So really the technology is there to protect our information. Um, it's really been more of like a habit change of, in my mind of consumers or, or even an understanding. You would think when you say telemedicine, it's intuitively obvious what it is. But so many people say to me, what is that? Like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, so I think it's really still a very new concept for people. But once you do it, um, it's hard to go back. I'm not saying don't do your regular visits with your physicians, but I have been saying to a lot of my friends right now, I mean, look, physicals, everything else, you need to show up annuals for women. But a lot of my friends are like, oh, well, I have an appointment with my doctor, but I guess I'll just schedule it for you know September. I'm like, no way call their office, get on their website, see if they're doing telemedicine. Like doctors are, is my heart. They're often small business owners. Think about it. They're one, two people in a practice often, not necessarily owned by the hospital system. And they're struggling right now because nobody's walking through their doors. 
Like this is a great way, I, I think, to even be supportive of healthcare professionals right now. For sure. Speaking of supportive, uh, you have uh, taken Hollywood by storm ah! uh, in, in a way, um, and you have a campaign uh, along with a number of other women called Women on Top. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, well, first, I have to tell you, we all wear sweaters that say Women on Top, like in solidarity. I, I've seen them. I've seen them all over the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I, I have to tell you, I was leaving LAX um, the last time, and I was going through security. And the, the guard on the other side is looking at me and she was like, women on top. She goes, girl, you know that can mean two things, right? I was like, I know. <laughs> it just, I love that reaction. Yeah, I, when, uh, when Eva Longoria was, you know, coming out of the Ivy and like the, I loved that the paparazzi are photographing her and everything else. And then they're like, women on top. I like your sweater. Um, but here's what it is. So to me, um, it's really been remarkable to get to know all of these women on top, women that we look to, who are truly dedicated to putting other women on top. That's what it is. And it was born out of this conversation around um, Addie and Sprout and a little bit of my story. Uh, we had a very funny video released through the Funny or Die crowd. A bunch of female comedians took this on. They were like, you know, we can use humor to poke at the absurdity that we don't talk about this for women, despite the fact that, you know, we've talked about it for men for so long. And by the way, it's good for everybody to talk about. It's not to, this is not male, female. This is like universal. Um, and, uh, and they did a premiere in New York and LA and it caught fire. And I think it just resonated to, with people a couple things. Um, and that is, you know, uh, the story of you can take on, uh, you can take on an injustice and win. And there were two, right? Not only the uh, FDA fight, but I think also the, what happened with the company. Um, and, um, and it's really about like everything that I do at the Pink Ceiling and in the Pink Evader is just putting power in women's hands. And, you know, the women who have surrounded me, that's the coolest part, uh, right? If you think about it, um, I would say in so many ways, including fighting the government, I took the road less traveled. Um, the remarkable part of that is you will be um, awed by who comes and walks alongside of you. And a lot of that has been, you know, Hollywood actresses. And we go into, um, you know, they're, they'll say, come over and meet all my friends and talk about what you do. And inevitably, then we all start talking sex and it becomes a confessional. Um, and that's very, that's very fun. Um, but it, they're ready to like own it in a different way. And, and for me, obviously, I am passionate about women's health, and, but also sexuality. And, uh, and I think I'm unafraid to talk about this in a conversation we're having about wellness and God bless, we finally are, we're talking about mental wellness and physical wellness, right? You can't turn on and not see some wellness. Well, the third aspect of that is sexual wellness. And it's going to be a, um, you know, almost $30 billion industry by 2025. And I'm glad that we, we, we broke the ceiling and we opened that door. And I think that there's so many things that have come through on that and a conversation ready to be had because it's part of your overall if you will, moxie and power of how you show up in this world. So when the movie gets made, who yeah. plays Cindy? Oh no, you have to pick this. I can't pick it. Who, <laughs> no, you who would you, me. Who, who would you want to play you? Oh, it's so hard. Oh my God. Um, uh, well, uh, you know, there's a, I adore Sandra Bullock. I always have adored Sandra Bullock. So like, I mean, come on. And, um, and I do laugh always at the Reese Witherspoon because I did a whole like tweet series about everything I need to know about business I learned from Legally Blonde. And you know, the, the pink pumps that I wear pink all the time, um, you know, that was born out of, well, first of all, I love pink. It's hard to find a childhood photo of me where I'm not in pink. Um, and it was born out of the fact that when I did this, people would say, oh, the little pink pill, that's so cute. That's so cute. And, um, and I thought, what? So, you know, pink is a little bit of the transition from underestimated to unapologetic. They didn't see me coming, but I wasn't gonna give up who I was. Um, and I would show up at the FDA in blazing hot pink. And that same lawyer I told you stories about would be like, please, can you just wear a sensible black pantsuit? And I would show up and the pinks would just keep getting brighter because we were going to talk about it. 
And so, you know, I think about the legally blonde, there is a little bit of that in all of us, male or female, right? We all have been underestimated in the room, overlooked, um, you know, in some way. And I think that that mind shift uh, from underestimated to unapologetic is a really uh, defining moment for all of us. I loved it. Uh, what's the one thing you would go back and tell yourself uh, at the start of your career that you know now? Like, What's the best piece of advice you could have given yourself? Um, damn, I wanted to say like my personal self, I would say have more sex, but uh, let me do my professional self. What would I tell myself? Um, I, I think it it's probably comes down to the only thing you will ever regret is that you didn't do it sooner. That's it. That's like my regrets are I should have done that a long time ago. And so, you know, when your instinct, your gut instinct is there, when everything inside is like telling you to do it, do it. Because you're only going to be sad you didn't at that time. You're going to live through way more pain um, in the interim. Uh, you're still going to get it done eventually. Yeah, I love that piece of advice. Uh, two last questions to wrap up, then you get to ask me one. Uh, what is your favorite book you've ever read? I'm such a broken record, but I am like the mega fan of Purple Cow. A Seth Godin fan. And I got to tell you, um, if you haven't read it, it's like I'm dating myself. Um, it's really a book about marketing, you know, um, and the, why remarkable wins, why remarkable attracts remarkable. But it really, for me, before I started Slate, was eye opening in that same concept of how do you stand out in a sea of sameness? And really, like, how do you recruit against a purple cow philosophy? For me, when somebody's reached my desk, on paper, like, they're totally qualified for the job. All I'm listening for are those cues of what makes them different in terms of how they stand out uh, for them to be part of our group. The, the resume means nothing. The, that it factor is everything. I love it. Um, aliens. Believer or non-believer? Okay. Um, I'm a believer by like association. And let me tell you what I mean by that. So I am, um, I count Mark Kelly uh, as a dear friend, um, astronaut, like talk about an incredible human being um, who's out there on the risk curve. And I heard somebody once ask him, right? Like Mark, is there, you know, is there life? Um, you know, outside of here. And, and he was like, why would we think there wasn't? Which is the right answer on so, for so many things in our life. Um, you know, when we're questioning, the right answer is like, why wouldn't we imagine that possibility? So yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm it's a believer. It's a big, the big scary world out there. It is. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I'm one question. Not signing up for like to, to travel to space. That's not you on my, not on my bucket list. Would, all right, so here's a question I love getting people's answers. Would you rather go to the depths of the ocean or yeah. to space? Like you had to choose one, which one are you less fearful of? The depths of the ocean. Really? Yeah. Why? I Because it's like the view would be great. <laughs> I, get to move from both. I don't know, I would be among other like fascinating creatures. I, I don't know, I think I don't know, I don't know the creatures above but i do know maybe what i'm dealing with below maybe that's where it comes from which one would you do uh i probably would go to space okay not, not because for any other reason than uh the ocean like there's definitely stuff down there we got no clue about like i saw well, look, you know, for you, sure that is true that is I, true i saw a video of it was like an octopus going through the water and it's changing colors based on what was around that's it crazy, and i'm just crazy. like I'm out, man. I, like, I'll just go to space. Hope I don't run into anybody. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you're gonna. There's life there. <laughs> Probably. What, uh, what one question do you have for me to, uh, to finish up? I have two. Oh. So one is, will you tell everybody the story about when you tried on high heels at the pink ceiling? Oh, I did. Yeah, I did do that. Uh, what, what was the story? I, we, you had a party. Yeah. Uh, me, Jason, a bunch of people went. And... Uh, Thesis Couture, which is a company that uh, we had invested in, uh, they have made the world's most comfortable heel. Uh, yeah. Dolly uh, came from SpaceX mm -hmm. and um, created this thing. And then what she sent, I think, a pair for you to try on. Yeah. You refused. And I think some, some people that work with you tried them on. 
I just want to say that Pomp had him on and was parading around. I did. Well, I don't know. No, I don't know if I was parading audience, around. I just need you to know there's some secrets here that I got. Um, I don't. I don't know if I if I have paraded around. I think I put them on and stood on one of them, but I don't know if I paraded they are around. By the way, how they shook me. <laughs> um, what's you know my story? My question for you is, um, what's the one thing your family gave you that that um, wired you for this? Uh thick skin like without a doubt because thick skin is one of these things um i'm a big believer in the idea that you can only develop thick skin yeah. you're not born with it yeah. and the way you get thick skin can be through experiences the way people treat you you know all this stuff you can't read about it in a book right yeah. and also like oh i have thick thick skin right and i grew up in a family four boys or five boys total four brothers uh, my dad was, you know, classic, just buster balls all the time. And uh, now you kind of look around the world, and you're like, actually, if you've got thick skin, like you're better set for the world than most oh, other yeah. people. And so it's, uh, it's funny, because if you ask me also, like who the toughest person in my family is, it's probably my mom, mm -hmm. which like, physically, maybe not. But like she will send our shit packing if we don't, you know, stay in line. <laughs> she she's outnumbered. She has to. I do attribute that. I have two big brothers. You know, you've met them. Like they are. Everybody thinks, oh, you're young. You're the youngest and a girl. Like oh. And I think they did not get that memo. Like they did not. They decided they were like here to toughen toughen me up. I have to tell one story. When right. Pomp and I first met. Wait for it. He showed up in a pink convertible, which I did. I knew we would be friends from the moment you pulled up. But that was I can't. I don't even know what make it was. It was one of these like spectacular, like old school. Your mom. No. So uh, I had a black avalanche, like a, a truck. Couldn't be more of like a male, you know, oriented truck. And uh, it was getting work on, and my mother had a pink Thunderbird convertible that my dad had gotten for her and like gotten fixed up. And he likes working on old cars, long awesome. story. But uh, I remember I, I was um, coming to meet you and I was like, oh shit, like I don't have a car to drive. So I was like, hey mom, can I grab a car? And she needed her car. She's like, well, just take that one. And I remember okay. looking at it being like, really? <laughs> And so you have like one of two options, right? If that's the situation you're in. And I didn't know anything about you wearing pink or any of this stuff. Exactly. And I was like, you either own it yeah. or you hide from it. And so I, I rolled down the windows, you know, blasted music and drove down the street in this pink car and then came right. to meet you. Yes. And it was like, I got to show you what's outside because you're going <laughs> to love this. <laughs> that's amazing. I love it. Well, thank awesome. you so much. So much fun. Of course. Time. Where where do you want to send people? Where, where do you want them to go? Yeah, please follow me on Instagram at Cindy Pink CEO. Uh, you can see all of our women on top campaign initiatives. And if you want to pitch or, you know, need some help with your business, it's thepinkceiling.com. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you doing this. I think people will enjoy it and uh, we'll do it again soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Pomp.